Welcome to Bethel Church and greetings from the Thornton family. This is a special week as we celebrate moms and other women who have influenced our lives. So we as a church want to bless you with a free cup of coffee or tea. So text the word mom to the number on the screen so you can receive a free gift. Because with Jesus, a loving community and a cup of coffee, that makes for a great week. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all. I know a lot of people have you on their mind Especially in this trial and time So I pray that they'll be fine But when they go back to their 9 to 5 They won't forget you The same God that helped them get through The shepherd that created the sky and the rain Was also the lamb that was slain Put a stain on the cross in the name of us He wiped the slate clean when his life was taken But death and Satan, death and Satan Were mistaken cause the tomb was vacant The lamb had died but the lion awakened
Hey, let me just say, first of all, thanks kids for helping us put together that Mother's Day video. That was awesome. And moms, happy Mother's Day. Uh, we love you. We wanna celebrate you today. We know that it's difficult to do that while we're away, but we have a unique way to do that today. So why don't you text the word mom to the number that's on your screen right now. We wanna recognize and celebrate you in a very unique way, and you'll receive a message back from us. So text mom to that number there as we continue to celebrate you around this special time. Well, let me invite you to, to turn to Luke chapter 18 this morning. I want you to be engaged this morning, so if you have a copy of God's Word or you have a device that you can turn to, Luke chapter 18 is our way of being engaged in God's Word. There are other ways as we move through this service to be engaged, so you can text the word prayer at any point to the number that's on your screen as well. And we also have sermon guides. If you go to Bethel.ch and go to our experience page, you can see adult and kid uh, sermon guides that will help you to stay engaged this morning. Well, you know, sometimes it's moms that make the most significant impact in our lives. It's significant people that make significant impacts in our lives. And sometimes it's even spiritual impact. Um, but other times there are, let's say, unassuming people in our lives that make significant impact, un unimportant and sometimes even unlikely people that make spiritual impact in our lives. I know for me, as a young believer, I'd only been following Christ for a few weeks. And uh, I was at a men's Bible study. And the church that I was attending, it was an evening, midweek uh, Bible study. We went down the stairs to the basement. It was the very first time that I'd ever been in a Bible study like that with a group of guys. And we went downstairs and we were getting settled in around our table, drinking terrible church coffee in the basement. And we were settling in and a man came stumbling in and there were some, some other men that were greeting him. And I remember that they took this man who appeared to be homeless. They took him, they got him a hot cup of coffee and they sat him down right next to me. Now here I am, this new believer, everything is new to me and here's this man that not only looks terrible but now I can tell smells terrible that's sitting next to me. And the men began the Bible study. And they opened up God's word and they began to, to study it and, and talk about um, what the text meant and life application points. And then they began a time of prayer. And as we were moving through this time, I remember several times I was listening to what the men were saying, but I was also noticing what this man was doing. And several times, I recall, he was just simply dozing off. Well, as we started into our prayer time, it, it became that, if you've been a part of a small group like this, that dreaded round robin of prayer. And so prayer started here and it was going around and it was making its way around the corner. It made that final bend and it was heading towards me. It was almost my turn to pray. Have you ever been there? I was there and it was approaching me and I had never in my life prayed out loud. And as it was coming around, the man beside me was praying and then it came to me and I was determined in that moment before it came to me, I wasn't gonna say a thing until it was my turn. And I decided to open up my mouth and I believe that it was God's spirit working in my life, brand new, and for the very first time I opened up my mouth and these are the words that I said. This is what the spirit was forming in my, my mind. I opened up my mouth and for the very first time I prayed out loud and I said this, God, whatever it is that you have done in me, I pray that you do for this man. And I just started to cry. Because in that Bible study and in that moment, I had recognized that this man that was destitute, that was drunk, that was sitting next to me, was worthy of God's calling. He was worthy of being saved by the God that had saved me. And as we moved through those moments, I was struck by the fact that just weeks ago, I was this man. I, in fact, as a 20-year-old kid, was destitute. I was struggling with addiction. And here I was weeks later, and in those first moments of that Bible study, I was struck by this, this man and actually turned my nose up at what this man was all about. But God, by his spirit, softened my heart and I prayed this prayer and I can tell you to this day, that man, I don't know his name, I don't even know if he's still alive, he made a significant spiritual impact in my life. The man that we're gonna look at today in Luke chapter 18 is, is a same, the same type of man. He's an unassuming guy. As a matter of fact, 
uh, he's so unassuming that we don't even find out his name in Luke. Now, the other synoptic gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and then Luke, which we are studying, Matthew records that there are actually, there are actually two beggars that approach Jesus, as we're going to see. Luke only talks about one. Mark tells us that this man has a name. His name is Bartimaeus, but Luke doesn't even name his name. Instead of focusing on the two or focusing on his name, Luke zeroes in on this man. And, and what's significant about this man is not his significance, but it's the significance of the testimony that he gives to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so if you found your way to Luke chapter 18, I, I want you to hear God's word and be struck by this simple, unassuming man and his supernatural ability to point us to Christ. Luke 18, beginning in verse 35, it says this, As he, that is Jesus, drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. What an incredible story. Well, three things that I want you to see that this blind man sees before he can see. Three things, if you're taking notes, write down the first one, which is this. If we're gonna follow Jesus in the way that this man teaches us to follow Jesus, we need to see clearly. The first thing that we need to see is we need to, we ha we need to have eyes to see Jesus clearly. We need to have eyes to see Jesus clearly. Now, this story is very simple. If you're following along, just picture in your mind what we just read. There's a beggar, and begging was common in Jesus' day. This man is in a town called Jericho, and we can assume that since he's lost his sight, we know that he lost his sight because he says, I want to recover my sight. At some point, he lost his sight, and he's been begging for an indefinite period of time. And as he goes out and he begs, you can imagine him going out to his place and finding his, finding his way there, right? Feeling his way there. I don't, I don't know if you've ever been blind. I, I, I've never myself been blind or had any kind of visual imparity. Perhaps you have. But maybe you would even do this with me right now. Would you be willing to just close your eyes right now? I just want you to think about if you, if you have your vision, what it might be like to not have your vision. If, if you have kids in your living room right now that are watching this, you may wanna keep one eye open. But close your eyes here for a second if you don't mind. I want you to picture this. This man, he feels his way like he does every single day to his particular spot. And he's getting settled in. He's seated right where crowds are gonna pass him during the day. And he begins to hear the town coming alive. He hears women with clay pots shuffling by to go and gather water. He hears uh, he hears donkeys braying, and he hears the clomp of their hooves treading the dirt in front of him. He, he smells the marketplace coming to life that day. And then all of a sudden, the, the traffic picks up. You can go ahead and open up your eyes now. Maybe you can even sense or see that in your mind's eye right now. At this moment, there are people passing by. There's actually, at this moment, an extraordinary amount of people that are passing by. Lots of traffic moving through Jericho because it's almost Passover. And what we know is every pious Jew would travel through Jericho to get to Jerusalem, which is not the most direct route. 
The reason that they would do it is because they didn't want to step one single foot into Samaria. And so they would avoid Samaria entirely and they would go through Jericho and up to Jerusalem now for Passover. So, so traffic is heavy. But this man is struck in this moment, not by heavy traffic, but by a significant crowd. Notice again, verse 36. It says that he heard a crowd going by. He, 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 he heard this loud buzz Maybe it was people asking, is it really him? Could it, could it be him? Um, did you see him, right? And he inquires to somebody that's passing by what this means, this blind man. Verse 37 is, they told him as he inquired, it's Jesus of Nazareth passing by. And what ends up happening in this moment is significant. This is Jesus of Nazareth. And the only thing that we can assume is that this man has heard this name and he's heard what this man has been about these last three, three and a half years. And so what he does in that moment as he hears, the crowd is moving through because it is Jesus of Nazareth that has come. Verse 38 tells us this. He cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then verse 39 again tells us, there were those that were in front of him and they began to rebuke him. They, they told him to be silent. Just be quiet. Jesus doesn't have time for you. Now, I'm curious as to which group of people this was. If you read back, and I hope that you'll read back the entirety of Luke 18, perhaps today or this week. But in Luke chapter 18, a little bit earlier, there's a similar situation where there are parents that are bringing young children to Jesus so that he might bless them, and, uh, and they're bringing these children to him. And the disciples are the ones that are standing before Jesus, and they're rebuking the parents, saying that Jesus doesn't have time for little ones like this. They're insignificant in God's kingdom, and Jesus rebukes his disciples and says, don't do that. The kingdom's built upon and is populated by such as these. I hope that it wasn't the disciples that were making this statement yet again to this man, but perhaps it was. But somebody says to him, he does not have time for you. But verse 39 continues and it says, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And notice what happens next, the beginning of verse 40, and Jesus stopped. There's something about what this man said in the midst of lots of commotion and probably lots of people saying lots of things and maybe even pleading to Jesus for lots of things. There's something significant that this man says that causes Jesus to stop in his tracks. What is it? It's this simple phrase that is repeated twice and it's only said and stated here in the Gospel of Luke. He uses his title, Son of David. Did you notice it? It may not be significant to you, but it was significant to Jesus' ears, apparently, and it is significant in Scripture. You see, it's a messianic title. It hasn't been used again in Luke, but this man uses this title. And what he's, in, in, in essence, saying is, Jesus, I recognize that the Jesus of Nazareth that is before me is the son of David, is the Messiah. Now, where do we get this? Well, turn back, if you would, you can look on, the, it'll be on your screen here. 2 Samuel chapter 7 is where we get this prophecy in verses 12 and 13. As David is nearing the end of his life, I want you to listen to these words that are prophesied about his lineage. It says this in verse 12. When your days are fulfill, fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring, your son after you, who shall come from your body, David, and I will establish his kingdom. Now that could have been one of David's sons, but verse 13 tells us that it's not. It says this, he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom, listen to this, forever. What this blind beggar recognizes is that Jesus is the fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13. This is the lineage, the son of David, the Messiah, that God is gonna establish his kingdom on forever. He recognizes it. And what's so significant about this is not only that this man knows this, right? He declares this, but it stands that his, 
his declaration stands in stark contrast to a conversation that just happened prior to this with his disciples. Notice back in chapter 18 of Luke, verse 31. It says this, just before this moment in this conversation with this beggar, verse 31, it says, and taking the 12, Jesus said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the son of man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. Jesus says, this is what's going to happen to the son of man. This is what's going to happen to the son of David. This is what's going to happen to the Messiah. This is what's going to happen to me. Notice verse 34. It says, but when they understood, but, but they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them and they did not grasp what was said. Do you see the blind disciples? The disciples that cannot comprehend who Jesus is and what Jesus is about to accomplish in Jerusalem? And the contrast of this, this man who cannot see, that can actually see more clearly than even Jesus' disciples? You see, the very first step for you and I to become disciples of Jesus is that we need to see him clearly. Even if we, if, even if we don't, if we can't see, we, we, we can see. I don't even know if that makes sense. I was thinking about this this week. There's, there's a show on television right now. It's, I think it's been around for a couple of years called The Masked Singer. And it's this kind of silly show where they take these uh, musicians that were famous uh, long ago and they put them in silly costumes and they put a mask on them and there's a panel that tries to guess who the celebrity is that's singing just based upon their voice. Everything is masked and the only thing that they're listening to is their voice. And sometimes they're, they're able to do it, but other times they just simply can't because we don't typically just pay attention to someone's voice. We pay attention to their features and even who their front men are and you know just all of these other things. And when that's stripped away just down to that simple voice, could you identify them? That's what this man has. He has, again, no sight. And yet he is able to recognize the Messiah, the son of David, the Savior, Jesus, that is before him. How? Well, we can only assume that this man has a knowledge of Scripture. He has a knowledge of prophecy, and he probably has a knowledge of what Jesus of Nazareth has been accomplishing and so just hearing that song, hearing that script that is going out, this man not seeing anything, the masked savior, he hears it and he says, I know exactly who this is. This is the son of David. This is the Messiah. It's the first step for any of us in our journey in following Jesus is to recognize he is the savior. He's the savior of the world and he is the savior of you and me. He's not just a moral teacher. He's not just a great preacher. He's not just an incredible healer. He is the savior of the world. We need to see Jesus clearly. Number two, we need to, once we see Jesus clearly, we need to have eyes to see ourselves honestly. You know, I love this guy's gutsy faith. What you see this guy doing, just to capture this again, is first of all, he recognizes that he needs help, doesn't he? I mean, it's, it's obvious to everyone that this guy needs help. Here he is begging and he is blind. He has lots and lots of needs for resources and for recovery of sight. It's obvious. And so it just makes sense for him to cry out to Jesus, the son of David, for help, for mercy. I wonder if your needs are as obvious as this guy. You know, some of us that are listening to this, you have needs that are absolutely obvious and I'm gonna encourage you at the end of this service to cry out to God for mercy for the things that you need to ask him for. Your needs are obvious. But what I would also say is that many of us, we have needs, but our needs are not as obvious. You know, one of the things that I've discovered through this stay-at-home order is that I have a lot of needs. As a matter of fact, I have a lot of idols. And what this, what this lockdown has done for me is it has taken all of my idols, my, my idol of wanting time by myself. Um, you know, I, I'm isolated, but it's with a lot of people at my house. 
Um, I like time by myself. I like to be with, the, with, with, with other people. I love being by the body of Christ. All these good things, but sometimes they become ultimate things for us. And, 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 and a lot of my needs have been hoisted up. It's as if my idols have been lifted up. I wonder if your needs have been exposed during this time. This man recognized his needs and acted accordingly. Second thing that I, I'm a, I just appreciate about this guy is that he, he jumps at the opportunity to get to Jesus. You know, Jesus is passing through and this man does not know that Jesus will never be through here again. He, he doesn't know. I mean, maybe Jesus is staying overnight. Maybe he's gonna be back the next day. He doesn't know and he doesn't assume. And so he jumps at the opportunity to get to Jesus. I wonder if you would jump at the opportunity just like you would jump at a significant opportunity today. I, I was in the store the other day and I made that, that round down the, uh, the, 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 the paper aisle, and lo and behold, on the shelves for the first time in seven weeks at my grocery store was toilet paper. And I don't even know if I need toilet paper, but I saw the opportunity and I snatched it. This man, not to compare TP to JC, I guess, that's probably a pretty bad joke, but not to compare those two, but this man jumps at the opportunity. He doesn't know if Jesus is ever gonna pass and we know that he's never gonna pass by. He jumps at the opportunity. Have you jumped at the opportunity of Jesus passing by even today? The third thing that I see about his gutsy faith, faith is that he, he calls out to Jesus. Even though people are trying to keep him silent, I love this. Did you notice that? He cried out, first of all, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the people say, would you just be quiet? He does not have time for you. And he says, son of David, have mercy on me. He is not put off by the crowd. And the third or the fourth thing that I see in him that I, I just appreciate what he's teaching me as I've been studying this is that he knows that Jesus owes him nothing. And so he asks for mercy. He doesn't scream out, Jesus, son of David, uh, do you have a coin to spare? Do you, have, do you have bread that I can eat? He cries out for what every single one of us need. We need God's mercy. What he's saying to him is, as he's passing by, he, he cries out and he says, he says, Jesus, I need your mercy. And here's what mercy is. Jesus was in his own right. He had, he had his mind set towards uh, Jerusalem. He was headed there. Jesus had the right to continue walking. But instead, Jesus is gonna give this man what he asked for, which is mercy. He stops. That's God's mercy. He could have kept going, but he didn't. He stopped. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. God's mercy means his kindness. It means his patience. It means his forgiveness for us. That's God's mercy. And that's what he's crying out for. So in all of this, notice again, Jesus stops in his tracks. Why? First of all, he recognizes that he is the Messiah. And second of all, he cries out for what he desperately needs, which is mercy. And then notice how Jesus responds. Verse 40 stops Jesus in his tracks, and he commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, notice this question, verse 41, what do you want me to do for you? <laughs> what do you want me to do for you? I mean, the, the man has, has just been led over by people to Jesus. He is blind, right? And Jesus asked the man, what do you want me to do for you? I want you to think about this. Jesus is really giving this guy a, a blank check, isn't he? What would you have me do? If you could have me do anything for you, what would, me, what would you have me do? And I love what this man asked for because he could have asked for coin. He could have asked for bread. He could have asked for his enemies to be squashed. I'm sure that he had plenty of people that said nasty things to him. He could have asked for anything. And yet what he asks for is not bread or coin. He asks for a miracle. He asks the Lord, verse 41, Lord, let me recover my sight. I love that. You know why? 
because he believes in asking that question that Jesus can actually fulfill his request. He believes that Jesus has the power to restore his sight. I wonder if you had an opportunity, if you had one shot to ask the God of the universe for one thing, what would you ask him right now? I wonder if, if, if you're watching this with somebody right now, why don't you turn to them right now and say, if you could ask the God of the universe for one thing right now, what would you ask for? Turn right now and ask somebody that question. This man asks for his sight. He asks for a miracle. I wonder, I wonder if sometimes our prayers aren't too small, that we often settle for the bread as opposed to asking for the miracle. I want you to think about this statement. The scope and the significance of our prayers reveal the size of the God that we serve. The scope and the significance of the prayers in which we ask reveal the size of the God that we serve. If we were to measure the God that you serve by the size of your prayers, how big would your God be? This man asks a big, bold prayer. He asks for a miracle. And notice what happens. Verse 42, Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. Jesus draws attention to this the means, the conduit, the mechanism by which he is able to recover his sight. Did you notice it? It's faith. It is faith to believe the miracle. It's faith to believe that Jesus can do this. And so he reaches out and he asks that question, would you, rec would you help me recover my sight? And he gets exactly that. It is incredible what we're able to accomplish by faith when we ask. But, but let me go just one step further. Did you know, and I know Pastor Dave talked uh, about faith last week, and there are a lot of great talking points about faith. This man, by faith, is able to recover his sight because of Jesus. But did you know, even the faith to be able to ask is a gift? You know, if you go to Ephesians 2 8, you see, you, you see that faith is a gift, right? Many of us are familiar with this text in Ephesians 2.8 where it says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a, what's the next word? Gift of God. It's a gift. Or if you turn to Philippians 1.29, it says this, that those of us that believe, it says it has been granted to us or gifted to us to believe. Faith is a gift that God gives us. I wonder, friend, are you leveraging that gift that God's given you of faith? This man is able to humbly leverage it. He sees Jesus clearly. He sees himself honestly. And point number three is this. We need eyes to see our calling humbly. In the midst of highlighting all of what it means to, to be a disciple in Luke chapter 18, don't miss the fact that this blind man becomes a disciple. It's, it's, it's simple language. It's actually technical language that Luke has used in the past. But verse 42, as Jesus commands, recover your sight, your faith has made you well. Notice verse 43. And immediately he recovered his sight. And notice this next word, followed him, glorifying God. He followed him. You know what that means? That's the language of discipleship, isn't it? He followed him. He became a disciple of Jesus. Mark is going to tell us that he actually joins Jesus on the road. Like he gets in line to where the crowd is going as Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem and just joins in. He becomes a follower of Jesus, a disciple. You know what I think is is trying to be highlighted here by Luke through the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus pausing in this moment, is that he takes this man as, as he's entering into Jer Jer Jericho and before he goes to Jerusalem, and he has this, this next to last, and we'll see another example next week, but he takes this man and he shows him who he makes his disciples. Don't, don't, don't miss this. 
Jesus takes the unlikely. He takes the the ordinary, the unassuming, and he calls those individuals to follow him. I love this example for the 12 disciples that at that point were following him. This man gets in line, recognizes who Jesus is, recognizes who he is and his great need for God's mercy and gets in line and starts following Jesus. And I wonder if this wasn't a lesson for the 12 as they look on, just like me sitting beside that, that drunk homeless man with my nose up at one point and then my nose down dripping with tears because I recognize that I am that man. I wonder if that wasn't a lesson for those disciples. And guys, I wonder if that isn't a lesson for us today. This is the picture of every single one of us. To take it one step further, Paul actually, as, as he is writing and discipling from a distance, uh, the, the, the believers in Corinth, you, you might recall that the church in Corinth, was a, it was really a mixed bag. I mean, you've got all kinds of people that are coming to faith in Christ. And um, you've got people that are uh, professing faith in Jesus, but they have just gross immorality all over the place. So that's kind of one side of, of this church. And then the other side is you've got these people with these amazing gifts. Like you had these incredible experiences of these apostolic gifts. You've got prophecy. You've got people like, no joke, speaking in tongues. Like all of these amazing things are happening. And you can imagine with all of those incredible gifts in light of the deficiencies of some of those disciples, some of those people that have those incredible gifts, especially speaking and prophetic and you know, miraculous gifts, they, they might get prideful, right? I wanna remind you of, of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians when he says this to the disciples in Corinth. He says this in verse 26. He says this, For consider your calling, brothers. Like, consider the the fact that you were called to Christ, just like this man was called to Christ. Do you remember why you were called? He says this, Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Verse 30, and because of him, you are in Christ. And um, you are in Christ who became, that is Jesus, became to us wisdom from God righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. This reminder to the church in Corinth is a reminder to his disciples, is a reminder to us that if we are found in Christ, it is because we are the unlikely. We are the unwise. We are the not so powerful of God. Isn't that incredible? That we could be disciples of Jesus as the unlikely. You know, as we wrap this up, I hope that you have time to walk through the entirety of Luke chapter 18. What you see in there are a group of individuals that get an audience with God and even this man ends up being a follower of Jesus. But there's another group of people that end up not being able to follow after God. Let me just give you a glimpse, and I hope that you'll go back and you'll read this. In our stories, there are three undignified people that we see. The first one is this persistent widow. She she just wants justice, and there's no one that's giving her justice. And so she goes to the judge, and she keeps asking and asking and asking. And in her persistence, the judge says, fine, you can have it and she's shown favor. The next one is this tax collector who is going up for worship. And there's a Pharisee that's trying to worship, but this man, he's so broken by his sin. He's on his knees, beating his chest and just crying out, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And then the last one that we see is the beggar here. Three very undignified people that receive what they ask. 
In contrast, in Luke chapter 18, we find two dignified people. The first one is a Pharisee that we see, and he is going up to the temple, and he is praying and asking God to show him favor because he's just better than people like this tax collector that keeps beating his chest. He's, he, he's, he's dignified in his righteousness. The other, the other picture is a man who's very rich that approaches Jesus and says, how do I enter into the kingdom? And he says that he obeys all the commands, but Jesus says, I want you to give away all that you have and come follow me. And the man cannot follow Jesus, Jesus because he's too dignified in his riches. You know the difference between these two groups? This is what I want to leave you with. It, it, it's this. One group walks away with nothing and one group walks away with everything. The group that walks away with everything, they were desperate. The group that walks away with nothing, they were dignified. They were prideful. Friend, I want to challenge you in this way. Would you let your desperation overwhelm your dignity? Would you let your desperation be your cry Regardless of what it looks like, lay your pride and lay your dignity, dignity and lay your, your self-respect aside. And with desperation like this man, cry out to Jesus, the son of David, for his mercy. Ask him in, in desperation, overwhelming your dignity. Ask him what that one thing is that you need. Ask him for the miracle. Ask him for that big thing because he is a big God. Let your desperation overwhelm your dignity. And then number two, let your desperation overwhelm your discipleship. We are desperate not only to know Christ, but to be found in him and to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called, Ephesians 4.1. We, we wanna be found in him. Life with Christ starts now and lasts forever. And we wanna be desperate disciples that just hunger and thirst for him above all else. Will you do that today? For those of you that are watching this and you are not yet followers of Jesus, if you don't yet know Jesus, I just want you to know this. It isn't because he won't have you. It's because you haven't cried out to him yet. Do you know if you cry out to him right now, he will stop in his tracks as he passes by even now and attend to you. And those of you that are followers of Jesus, I wanna challenge you to be grateful for his mercy. He's called us. He's opened up our eyes. We have the privilege of following him for a lifetime. Let's follow him in desperation. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts that beat for the things of you. Father, we wanna see you at work even now in our separation, in, in, in the struggle as needs have been brought to our attention. God, we want to see you at work. So God, continue to do your incredible work. Thank you, Jesus, son of David. Thank you, Jesus of Nazareth. Thank you, Jesus, son of God, that you are very aware of what we need. So Father, we just, we recognize your son. Help us to see him more clearly. Help us to see ourselves more honestly. And Lord, help us to just be overwhelmed with humility by the calling to which you've called us to. We ask this in Jesus' name.
church One bride Jesus Lord of all With one voice With one voice We cry Spirit of God Breathe on your church God, we pray to you, humble ourselves again. Lord, would you hear our cry? Lord, will you heal our land? That every eye will see, that every heart will know. The one who took our sin, the one who died and rose. So God, we pray to you. Again, Lord, would you hear our cry? Lord, will you heal our land? Then every eye will see, then every heart will know the one who took our sin. Speak through your word. We pray in every nation. Christ be known. Our hope in salvation. Christ alone. Father God, we come before you, Lord, as a nation as a church, as a people, and we ask you to heal our land, to heal our church, to heal us as individuals, Lord. Would you speak into our hearts and draw us near to you? Would you open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, to what you have for us right in front of us today, that we might not miss it in the midst of all that's going on around us, that we would seek you and draw near to you and grow deeper with you. Thank you for loving us, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. Let us help you get connected by filling out the Connect card online. You can keep up with everything going on at Bethel by visiting our website at Bethel.ch and be sure to follow us on social media. You can also give online at Bethel.ch forward slash give. Did you know May is Mental Health Awareness Month? As the church, we want to speak into the space where mental health and faith connect. In the midst of the global pandemic, you may be feeling more isolated than normal. Unwanted thoughts, overwhelming emotions, and conflict in your home may appear more frequently and lead to anxiety, depression, and loneliness. You are not alone. In an effort to help provide resources for those who need support, 
our Care and Compassion team will be hosting a series of webinars in May focused on issues surrounding mental health and healthy relationships. Join us for the next three Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. as counselors and local experts discuss issues related to COVID-19 mental health, including healthy marriages, suicide prevention, and resources for singles navigating the crisis alone. You can register online at Bethel.ch forward slash equipped to care or email care at Bethel.ch for more information. I hope to see you there. Thank you again for joining us today. I can't wait until we can meet again in person and worship as one voice in one place. As Pastor Jason shared, may your desperation to know Christ be found in him and follow him grow deeper with each passing day. And lastly, happy Mother's Day to all the important and special women in our lives. Thank you to all mother figures who nurture, protect, and care for others. To the women who drop off meals, help watch children, send encouraging text messages, and pray for others, you are the embodiment of Christ's love, and we are thankful for you. To my fellow moms, mothering in a time of social distancing is not perfect, and I applaud you for taking each day as it comes as best as you can. Never were the words, I need you every hour, most gracious Lord, ever so true. If you are a mom who has experienced grief or loss on your motherhood journey, you know this as well, as you have leaned on Christ to uphold you and comfort you in your time of need. We have a unique worship experience online for you to honor your journey at Bethel.ch forward slash Hannah. Moms, you are doing great things for the kingdom. Keep it up. Moms and mother figures, text MOM to the number on your screen for a free coffee. You deserve it. Thank you for loving us well. Hey everybody, thanks again for joining us today. Have a great week and don't forget to celebrate all the women in your life. And especially your moms. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day! Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day! Day. Woo -hoo. <laughs>